What's up, everybody? I want to do episode 15 really quick, and it's actually not going to be a quick video, but it's going to be regarding fingerprint evidence or obtaining fingerprints. And I want you to watch a quick video before I go into this of some of the things that a police officer says, or definitely one of the things that I heard a police officer say. Probable cause to contact me? Well, well actually, it is. No, I do. Because suspicious it's, person, it's, you're not probable cause. It is. It's suspicious no. activity. Right, so, right. can, I I go and, you. can I go and see your driver's license and ID, please? No, that, that's all right. Well, you're a suspicious person. And that's I, not a law. But, but that's I have, not a crime I've, I've broken. That gives me reasonable suspicion okay. to contact you. So, no, I'm asking, can I see your driver's license or any proof, ID, anything like that? Yeah, at this point, it would be an obstruction of justice if you, you oh, you're, you're going to charge me? It's, charge me? it's an obstruction of justice if you have evidence, yes. Okay, go ahead and charge me. I just need to see your ID. Why? Well, I don't want to tell you my name. You guys are mistreating everybody. Why am I going to give you my name the way you treat people? I'm sorry. I'm not did, I, did you hear me tell him to stop resisting? Yeah, it's on the video. Fantastic. Yeah. I have a copy of the video. Come no. with me. Come with me. So you have evidence on your phone that I can't have? Yeah. You can, you can give me a subpoena. Seize his phone get his ID. You give me a subpoena. The reason why I bring this up is the fact that this is one of their techniques because they're attempting to use something that's called the identification of criminals act because you'll hear them say a lot of times are you on probation are you on parole and the reason they ask that question is because if you are on probation or you are on parole you quote unquote are not a human being so you have no rights but again you remember I told you once the state can't give them to you so they can't take them away now understanding this is going through the Identification of Criminals Act. I'm going to go through a couple of court cases. The first one is McGovern versus Van Ripper. And it's a New Jersey um, Supreme Court case in regarding fingerprints. And it simply states, there is no justification for taking fingerprints, photographs, or other measurements in advance of conviction. Now, the purpose of the Identification of Criminals Act is to do that, identify people that have already offended or current offenders because if you go back to the original purpose of fingerprinting it was used to distinguish prisoners from one another the reason why I have issue with this is because during this the fingerprints are part of the Constitution because in essence they are an act of privacy and then there is a misuse of how the quote unquote fingerprint evidence is used because fingerprints or become and remain a permanent record, a permanent stigma, and notwithstanding the withdrawal or dismissal of any charge. So once they have it or have copies of your fingerprints for whatever reason, that record is forever so if you haven't committed a crime or haven't committed an act for them to have it that is something that should be or housed as sacred to you now the biggest thing again with fingerprint usage is the fact that fingerprint analysis can have false positive rates as high as one in 306 cases they love to use things such as oh well Fingerprints are unique, and they can single out one in a billion. They always throw out a ridiculous number because, oh, well, there's only 300 million people that are counted in the U.S., so it's, if you got this one print, it's it. The reason why that is absurd, because, again, false positives in one in 306 cases. Here's why that number is much lower than the millions that they use or even the billions that they use. Back in 2004, there was a Madrid train bomb. There was a young man that was arrested for that crime because his fingerprints was found on the bomb making material. Now, in doing so, he was arrested. The facts of this were astounding because while Madrid, Spain is a beautiful place, Mayfield had never been to Spain and they later found out after he had been incarcerated and he had been tried that the fingerprints matched 
somebody else. Why? Remember, they use numbers like one in a million, one in a billion. So let's call it one in a million, right? Most criminal cases or most detectives or officers use a 12-point match for criminal cases while the majority of experts require 20-point match. The reason being, the higher the point match, the less likely the fingerprint belongs to someone else. Because fingerprints are rather unique, especially when you're using 20 points versus 12. Now, we're also going to go into a more succinct case because, again, this is a Fourth Amendment issue. And we have Davis versus Mississippi, 394 U.S. 721-1969. Fingerprint evidence is no exception to the rule that all evidence obtained by searches and seizures in violation of this Constitution is inadmissible in state court. And Fourth Amendment applies to involuntary detention during the investigatory stage as well as the accusation stage. Now, when we talk about police encounters, we talk about investigations. Well, I'm doing an investigation, so I need to know who I'm talking to. No, you don't. Because if you're investigating, you are trying to find out what it is that's wrong. Because during the investigation, you don't need to know who it is until you figure out if I've committed a crime. If you can't articulate a crime, then your investigation needs to be very minimal because long periods of detention are Fourth Amendment violations. Now, if you don't know my name, that means that you do not have a quote-unquote call to be here speaking to me. Two, you don't have anything from a judge that states that you need to be talking to me. So therefore, most of your conversation is going to be absent of probable cause. So now we're going to go into the video I showed just a few seconds ago. The detentions for the sole purpose of attaining fingerprints are subject to the constraints of the Fourth Amendment. And like we said, fingerprint evidence is not an exception to all other evidence. And when we speak about that, we look at things that are such as what part of your investigation requires my fingerprints. Because generally, when you're talking about fingerprint evidence, that means they have a copy that they need to do a comparison to. Now, if you need to do an elimination, there needs to be things that are done that require only the comparison and not permanent storage. And again, that's something that we're going to get into later as we go through these series. And at the investigatory stage or the police stop, not really that time. But we're going to go into another part of Davis v. Mississippi. And basically it's P394 US 728. It is not determined whether Fourth Amendment requirements should be met by narrowly circumscribed procedures for obtaining during a criminal investigation fingerprints of a person for whom there is no probable cause to arrest since no attempt was made in this case to employ procedures which may comply with the Fourth Amendment. Basically what that means is uh, something I'm going to go into. It's called a map hearing and it goes into the fact that they have to have probable cause even with your fingerprints. They have to be articulating a crime even for a pat down because the words I told you about that are huge in law are the words if and the word and. These are things that employ their procedures. Now remember your fingerprint evidence or your fingerprints as part of your person, as part of your privacy should be kept just as that. And I'm going to read you a portion of the Identification of Criminals Act because this is one of the arguments that are made that's made in order to keep those prints 
private and them saying, well, I need to know who you talk. No, you don't. What you need to do is figure out what crime I've committed. Because that's what an investigation is for. And identification of criminal acts reads, the requirement subjecting an accused to fingerprinting under the Identification of Criminals Act before conviction for an indictable offense infringed upon one's right as protected by the charter agreed upon and held by every executive and judicial officer involved within the matter. I'm going to stop right there just for a second because again the reason why it's every executive officer and judicial officer because the one thing they all have in common is an oath of office. They took an oath to upheld the constitution of the state as well as the constitution of the United States of America and in doing so they became public servants you became their master as part of the public the reason why it violates that without probable cause is because there is something that is carried with it throughout your entire life it's permanent it's not a temporary thing unless you force it to be a temporary thing if it becomes part of a record that's going to follow you it has to have strict guidelines even in that matter so now I'm going to continue this also violates the elements of dignity and self-respect the accused is offered through the safeguards of the application of constitutional restrictions placed upon those in charge of the freedom of the people because the idea by the common man is fingerprinting is not carried out except in the only respect of one having engaged in criminal activity so to be fingerprinted is to be treated as a criminal if you have not committed any criminal act and then you are subjected to criminal activities then you yourself have been enslaved I'll go into that later because again this is not my opinion this is a court case what I just said comes from another court case a Supreme Court case these are things they don't want you to know because when you turn 18 or even I'm gonna go a step further when you get your first identification or driver's license or state ID you are deemed to know the law and they hold you to that respect just as I stated to you previously when a police officer goes to you well I don't know if you're armed I have to check I don't know is not something that you would take from a child to offer them anything other than a lesson and teaching them what that is so I don't know from an adult that is trying to do something to you is not an acceptable response because the only time I don't know is acceptable is when you're responding to them about why they are standing in front of you because they are supposed to know why they are standing in front of you why they are asking you questions because they have to articulate it only God loves fools and babies so being a fool and saying I don't know is not an acceptable answer in law so going through that understand there is a requirement and a standard that they have to abide by and that is the regular guidelines for search and seizure there has to be a reason for your fingerprint if you are not a criminal they can't subject you to some criminal activities and if they do they are in violation or breach of their fiduciary duty and by fingerprinting you and creating a permanent record they have harmed you so therefore they are liable for that and you now know how to begin the process of holding them responsible for it now keep in mind fingerprints are sacred they are a violation of the fourth amendment if they do not have a reason or probable cause 
for criminal activity or you have not been convicted. Notice I didn't say pre-conviction. You have been convicted. So until next time.